Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. I'm Bob an alcoholic. You're still here. You're, you're the people that used to hear the, the term, last call. You know, non-alcoholics hardly ever hear that. <laughs> um, well, I get to share my experience on, on a step that I was also, I'm re, I've been resistant to all of this. Isn't it odd? Isn't it so odd that I resist the things that really light me up and make me happy and free? I got sober um, in 1978, and I asked a man to sponsor me. And I asked a man to sponsor me who I met because he brought a meeting twice a week into the detox I was in. I didn't know that he was a five percenter. And when I say five percenter, what I mean by that is I I heard in a general service conference in my early sobriety, a trustee say that he believed that five percent of of the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous did 95 percent of the service in 12 step work. And then he went on to say that five percent, as long as they remained a five percenter and continued to do it, never drank again. And I wanted that. And my first sponsor was a five percenter. He'd been delegate. He'd been intergroup. He'd been, he started the Las Vegas Roundup, the retreat. I mean, he was on the board for the, the, the nonprofit men's halfway house. He was, he was the guy in all of Las Vegas. I didn't know that. When he came into the detox, I just thought that he didn't have a life. I just thought he didn't have a life. You know, that's why he was in there. Uh, little did I know he had a huge house up on the hill with tennis courts and gardens and a pool and a spa, two brand new Cadillacs. He was one of the most respected businessmen in all of Las Vegas. I didn't know that. But behind, even though he had all the trappings of success, deep within his soul was the conviction that the most important thing he could ever do in his life is to help another drummer. And so he came into the detox twice a week. He said yes. And I got him to sponsor me because I had just tried to commit suicide, and he told a story in detox that was fascinating. It was about his suicide attempt. And he wasn't making this up. You couldn't. He was talking about feelings and thoughts that you had to have been there. And I'm sitting there, and I'm nodding my head. And he's talking about how he felt when he got sober and how his failures at trying to go, how he'd always go back to drinking again. And I'm sitting there, and I'm nodding my head. And, and, and something occurred to me. It was like, I like him, evidently, but something has happened to him because he laughs a lot. I don't laugh. No, I'm sober. Sober. <laughs> Nothing funny. Nothing. I have no humor. So I, the guy accused me in early sobriety of having my sense of humor surgically removed. I mean, I, and that seriousness is one of the big symptoms of the bondage of self. This guy laughed a lot. And I remember thinking, man, something, this AA must have done something for him. And if that could happen for him, could that happen for me? And I was afraid to hope because I had no more entitlement. I was afraid to hope because I had lost all hope. I was afraid to hope because I didn't feel like I deserved anything good. But I did something that was out of character for me. I went up to him and I asked him, if he'd sponsor me, and I was so afraid. I remember that feeling of fear, like he was going to throw me away. He was going to reject me because that's all I felt like I was worth. So I said to him to, to, to sweeten the pot a little bit. I said, if you will sponsor me, I'll do anything you ask me to do. 
not knowing that they have a lot of things they want you to do. I mean, and none of them seem like a good idea. I've never, none of them went, oh, I can't, I get to write an inventory. This is amazing. I, none of it seems like a good idea until after you do it. And one of the early, well, he had me praying. One of those, that was, I didn't want to do that because I didn't believe in God. But he had me. And then one of the early, I wasn't even out of detox, but a week. And he starts hammering me to do service to help people. He wants me to be one of the guys that's taken the meeting into the detox with him and some of his cronies. He wants me to sign up on the 12-step list. He wants me to take a meeting into Reality House and, and, and Samaritan House. He wants me to sign up for the new meeting that's going to start in the state penitentiary right outside of town. And he just hammers me, help people, help people, help people, help. Oh, geez, like a broken record. Just help people. You know, I just, oh. And I, you know, I worked as a counselor at one point and I had a lot of therapy. So I said to him with my therapeutic background, I said, well, don't you think I should work on me for a while? And he looked like he bit into a lemon, you know, just, and he reared back and he said, work on you. You've done quite enough of that. Stop it. And when he said that, I didn't argue. I said, that's. Yeah, okay, because I, if I could have been fixed, I'd have been fixed by now, for God's sakes. And I started doing everything he suggested. And uh, he had I ended up sponsoring guys really early in sobriety. Didn't know what I was doing. I, and I was afraid. But I, I started doing it. There's a guy in California who says, says, if you're afraid that you're going to kill somebody, he said, ah, you got to kill a couple to get good at it. Uh, <laughs> That's not true. I don't have the, I'm a vehicle for God's grace. I don't have the power to fix somebody. I don't have the power to kill somebody because the burden of all lessons in the realm of the spirit is on the student. It's never on the teacher. We're just instruments here. So I started doing this and I don't know why I'm doing it. And it's inconvenient. <laughs> you know, cause I, maybe some of you are like me. I, I, I have this feeling, this sense that I need many, many hours each day to contemplate me. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm a thinker. I'm a thinker. Which I, is stupid because I've never sat and pondered myself and spiraled upward. You know what I mean? I don't do that. I just, you know, but that's my nature. So he's pushing me into all this 12. He got me really busy. And I was going to, you know, I was doing, I was doing a couple H&I meetings a week. And I was, I was probably doing a total of close to 20 meetings every week because I, I discovered something early in sobriety. I was better off with you than I was when I was alone with me. A lot better. And so I just went to all, because being with you was a little, and I, plus no, I wouldn't not only go to a meeting, I'd go to Denny's and coffee shops after the meeting, before the meeting. I lived in Alcoholics Anonymous. And I, I remember some, I was working as a counselor my first year of sobriety against my sponsor's wishes. So, said, so that's like the blind leading the blind, you know, I've, um, but I had someone tell me who was a professional. They said, you may, you may be replacing your addiction to alcohol with your an addiction to AA. You know what I thought? I thought, who cares? This is the best I've done. And I've been in and out of AA for, for a lot of years. And I, I did it. I didn't understand it. I didn't understand what, why I was doing it. I just understood that my sponsor wanted me to do it. And I... I wanted his approval desperately. And this is the only place I've ever come where you took something that would often be considered a defect of character and you turned it into an asset. I wanted his approval so he got me to take actions I, I wouldn't have taken. But I wanted his approval. And I wanted the approval of the other members of my home group also because they were all doing it. And so it was easy to do something that the people you respect are doing, right? I started doing it. And I remember 
I, I had done and really work the steps. I worked, I did an inventory my first year and the third step, but I didn't really work the steps out of the book until about four years sober after I heard my first, went to, heard my first Joe and Charlie thing. And uh, it, because I got sober in the 70s, um, there was not a big book consciousness and most of the fellowship of AA just didn't exist. People were trying to work the steps out of the 12 Steps and 12 Traditions book, which is nuts. I mean, I try, I've done that. I, I wrote a fourth step out of the 30-some question. I, I, so I didn't really do it out of the big book until I was over four years sober. And it was an amazing thing. But people in those days stayed sober by making amends. You had to clean up your whole mess, everything. Pay back every dime. No negotiation with that at all. You had to develop a relationship with God, and people in AA didn't care if you believed in God or not. We, they wanted you to take the actions, and they wanted you to do service. And so my sponsor was all about all of those things, and he had me pushing into this stuff. And, but I still, because I haven't worked the steps out of the book yet, I still intermittently suffered from depression. It was one of the reasons I went to 15 to 20 meetings every week. I discovered something. Depression has a hard time hitting a moving target, right? And so I just, right, I just keep going. I just, I do a lot of it. I'd be exhausted by the end of the, you know, I'd, I'd come back from a 10, 15 to 11, 15 meeting at night. I'd be exhausted. And one night, I'm at the 10, 15 meeting. And I'm, I'm not doing well. And I was, I was, I had started sinking into a deep depression. I somehow I got out of my apartment. I didn't know what else to do, so I thought I said a little prayer. I thought maybe if I can get to this ten fifteen meeting, this uh, late meeting, that maybe I'll hear something that snap me out of this funk I'm in. Because I get scared when I, I drank in the seven years I was in and out. I drank over depression. Because until my emotions have put the screws to me so much, I just I do anything for relief. And I'm 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 moving down that road. And so I, I go to this meeting because I don't know what else to do. I don't have much else. And, and I'm sitting in that meeting and I'm trying to ponder my life and I'm just you know, isn't it funny? The more I think about me, the more problems i I realize I almost overlooked. Do you know what I mean? And I uh, and I've got all these problems. And I'm sitting there, and I'm just I'm not doing very well. And I can't I can't hear anything in the meeting. Depression is the is at the somewhere in the apex of self involvement. And when I got me right on me, I, I get a disconnection with reality. And the disconnection is what's going on in the meeting or in life is so far away, it's like music in a doctor's office. It's just, it doesn't even mean, it doesn't get to me because the big show is on the inside. That's what happens to self-centered thinkers. The big show is on the inside. And so I'm in the meeting. I don't know. God could be trying to talk to me in the meeting. I don't hear nothing. I'm just thinking. Well, there's a guy sitting across. I'm sitting in the back row. There's a guy sitting across from me in that row who's evidently coming off a drunk and he's sitting he's grabbing himself like this he's rocking back and forth and i know that one and his, his nerves are shot he gets up he can't even sit very long he's pacing like a like a caged animal behind the back row and then there's like the bathroom's right there you can hear the inter intermittently he goes in there and he's dry heaving and, and i am trying to figure out all these problems and this guy's annoying the crap out of me <laughs> By the end of the meeting, I'm not any better. I'm actually probably worse because I think the subject was gratitude or something. You know, it's like, it, it, and I, I, leave, I start to leave and this guy, Charlie, who's the secretary, wanted some help, you know, putting the, was it this chapel, putting the chairs back and the, getting rid of the trash and all that stuff. So I stayed. Charlie and I are the last two guys to leave and he's locking up the chapel door. We're standing right outside the front door. And we look over, and the guy who was coming off the drunk is laying on the ground next to my car. Now, I would have to just about step over him to go home and ponder my life more deeply, which is what I wanted to do, except 
Charlie has a big mouth. And he'll tell my sponsor and everybody in AA what a bad member I am if I don't go help this guy. And he, you know, and Charlie has to go to work. He's working up at a graveyard shift up on the strip in one of these bust out hotels. And and I, he says, "You got to help the guy." And I, God, I don't want to help that. Go over to him, you know. And he's he's peed his pants. Uh, I don't want him in my car. You know? And he has no medical insurance, so I can't take him to the to the treatment center. There's only there's I don't know what to do. We used to do two things back in those days before they had uh, the free treatment center, free detoxes. You take a guy into your home, did this a bunch in the early years, and you give him a shot of vodka, maybe every hour, a little orange juice about every hour or so, just to keep him from going flopping around like a fish out of water on the floor of your living room. Or, or you take him, you could take him to the county hospital, but it was a pain. Oh my God, I'd been up there before with guys. They treat you like a redheaded stepchild. I'm telling you, they'll, they'll just, they'll ignore you. They, cause they, they'll take people that come an hour after you into the waiting room because they'd rather treat the legitimately sick people than these self induced alcoholics who are probably going to be back here again next week anyway. So I know what's coming. I'm going to be there all night. I got to go to work in the morning. I'm going to be tired. I'm going to be in a bad mood. I'll probably get in a fight with my boss. I'll probably lose my job, but it's a sucky job anyway. How doesn't anybody else step up to the plate except me? And the key word's me. Um, so I'm driving up there. And the, we get in there and, you know, sign on sign on this thing and then we're sitting in the waiting room I'll tell you how long ago this was honestly guys just some of you guys can think this is crazy used to be able to smoke in in hospital waiting rooms I so I'm giving the guy cigarettes and we're you know and talking and we sat there for several hours and he started to open up to me and he started to tell me about uh he doesn't know what happened to his drinking but he can't even drink away the shame and the guilt anymore and he drinks in depression. He, he told me that for some time, uh, he's wished he had the courage to kill himself. And then he cooked me. He really he said, this really got to me. He said, I don't know why you're wasting time with me. I'm not like you people in AA. You see, I always drink again. And he is telling me the story of seven years of my life. I mean, he's hitting it. And somewhere in the wee hours of the morning, sitting in that emergency room, waiting room, I, I think, I don't know how to, any way to put it, except I think I fell in love with this guy. I remember all of a sudden, my problems, I don't know where they went, but they were gone. And he was very important to me. His well-being, really, I was like, I, it was all I was sitting there thinking about. What am I... I'll get him a bed in here and then I'll come back and I'll take him to my home group. I'll take him to the Thai club and I'll, you know, I'll just, I want him to be okay. Maybe I could see it so and so and get him a job. And they eventually checked him in. And I'm driving home and it's the sun's just, just starting to break across Sunrise Mountain. And, and it's, you know, I've seen, uh, phew, I've seen probably a couple hundred sunrises. Honest to God, I never saw one like that. Because I don't know that I was ever really present. See, I'm the kind of guy, if I see, I could see the most beautiful sunrise in the world. It could last for 30 minutes and I'll actually experience about five seconds of it. And the rest of the time I'm thinking, well, that color reminds me of this. And then I watch so-and-so, I should tell them about this. And, you know, because I'm a thinker, but I was really there. And I saw that blush, that pink blush across the horizon. And, and I remember feeling something in that car driving home. And I think it was the presence of God. I don't know that I could have said that, but I felt a connection and it was an amazing. And I had a, an overwhelming sense of rightness. Earlier in the evening, nothing was right. Now, 
everything is perfect and right. And I understood for the first time why my sponsor and all these old timers kept hammering me to help people, help people, because they knew that no matter how great a narcissist you are, no matter how self-obsessed and self-focused and self-absorbed you may be, no matter how much of a depressive you might be, that if you do that, those actions long enough, one day you'll hear this loud as your head comes out of your butt, and you'll actually, you'll actually show up where the sun rises and where God is and where uh, Bill calls it being rocketed into the fourth dimension. I sponsored a guy who was a scientist. I said, ask him, I said, what's the fourth dimension? It sounds science fiction to me. He said, well, Einstein and a bunch of people said, thought that the fourth dimension was time. I thought, what's that mean? He said, well, maybe you've never really been in the moment. Maybe you live up here in the story of life, but you don't actually live life. That morning, coming home from that hospital, I, I was so present. I, I just, it was an amazing event. And I understood why the old timers are hammering me to do this, because they knew that Eventually, this these actions would lift me up off of me and set me free. Permanently? No. It's much like whiskey. You know, I never drank a bottle of whiskey where I didn't know I'm going to have to re-up tomorrow. You know what I mean? I always knew that. I never fantasized that this is going to fix me once and for all. I knew tomorrow I got to get another bottle. And that's why and Bill says in the book, uh, every day is the day we must carry a vision of God's will into all our activities. How can I best serve thee? Thy will, not mine, be done. In, in Bill's story, I, I identify with Wilson so much, more so than Dr. Bob, because Bill was a depressive. And, and in his story, he talks about almost drinking because of this he, he, the self-pity and resentments that would build up. And I get that. And he said he discovered that if he went down to Towns Hospital and he spent a couple hours down there trying to help some poor guy who was throwing his guts up, that he'd be miraculously uplifted and set on his feet. He referred to it as a design for living that works in tough going. And I got to tell you, over the last 43 and a half years, I've gotten through the toughest times in my sobriety by helping others. Is it, it, it's counterintuitive because it feels like when you're having a bad day and your life's falling around, falling down around you, it kind of feels like I need to work on me. No, you need to forget yourself and go help somebody else. But that is not an easy lesson to learn for a self-obsessed, self-management kind of guy like me. And so I started doing this 12-step work, and I started getting the results. I remember my first sponsor said something to me that it, just, it came true, not right away. He said, you don't have to worry about anything. God takes good care of his servants God pays well. And I didn't know that that was a paraphrase out of the, one of the third step promises. That having a, have, having a new employer being all powerful, he'll provide what I need. If I can do two things, keep close to him. So every morning and, and most throughout the day, sometimes I'll turn my consciousness towards God. But even more importantly, perform his work well, which is helping his kids. And as a result of that, I feel closer to God when I'm helping his kids than I do when I'm praying, praying and meditating. I feel more connected to God in helping his kids. And so uh, this becomes a way of life for some of us, I, the ones that are lucky. I, I uh, geez, in the beginning a chapter working with others, it says that nothing, nothing will so much ensure immunity from drinking is intensive. What do you, how much do you think intensive is? 
intensive work with alcoholics. And it says it works where all other activities fail. It works when calling your sponsor fails. You're having a bad day, you call your sponsor, and your sponsor's like, wow, 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 wow. I can't even hear him. I can't go to meetings, don't work. I can't hear nothing. Do you ever try to do you ever try to read the big book when you're having a really bad day? It's like taking the paragraph you read and throwing it into a tornado. It's just I can't. Five seconds after I read it, I can't tell you what I read. Because it's like crazy in here. But intensive work with other alcoholics works where all other activities fail. Truly, it does. And I've been very lucky. I've watched a lot of people come and go uh, in Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, you know, one of the questions, I don't ask this much anymore, but I you know, I've I've done a lot of detox meetings. You know, right now I'm kind of I lost. I, I turned over one of my favorite detox meetings over to one of my sponsors, sponsees, and now he's moved me out. I mean, he's a, he now he's putting his friends in there. I was aggravating. Well, I still got one left that I'm doing. I'm gonna somehow st I might steal that one back from him. <laughs> I don't know. I'm at my best when I'm doing two of those meetings a week at least. And so uh, I I go to these places, and Vegas is an unusual city. It It's the kind of place that if you're sober 30 years or 40 years or 20 or 10 years and you drink again, there's something about Vegas that will call you. It's, they call it the adult, it's like the hitting bottom capital of the world. And we, we get a lot of people that, and you know, they, they took, they had $2 million in the retirement fund. And they picked up a drink with 25 years of sobriety and Vegas calls them and they go, they end up in Vegas and Vegas takes it all away from them. It, it'll take $2 million away from you between the, the, the prostitutes, the gambling, the drugs, and the alcohol. So quick, it'll make your head spin. Unbelievable. These guys end up in our detox. I, I, there was a period of time back when our first real estate boom, our first, when Vegas was really growing, where it seemed to me like there wouldn't be a week that would go by. I wouldn't have somebody in the detox that was sober over 10 years that drank again. We had one guy 45 years. And I wanted to find the common denominator. Because I don't know about you guys, but I, I, my last drunk accumulated in such a degree of anguish that I tried to take my own life. And I, don't, I know what's waiting for me. So whatever they did that got them to drink or didn't do that got them to drink, I want to find out what it is. I want the common denominator because I, whatever it is that they didn't do, I'm going to do it. And whatever it is that they did do that they shouldn't have do, I'm not going to do it. And so I started asking a little questions to these people, you know. And some people tell you it's a myth. Well, they probably stopped going to meetings. That's so untrue. I'm telling you, I knew guys that drank again, and I knew guys that committed suicide that went to two meetings the day they pulled the trigger. Some people say, well, they, they must have lost their connection with God. That is also not true. I've so, seen so many exceptions to that. Deacons, ministers, priests who have such a better relationship with God than I got. And they drank themselves to death. So I, I stumbled on a question to ask these new guys that uncovers a commonality in the relapse. Here's the question. Oh, my God, I'm so sorry you're here. I'd like to help. If you would, here's a piece of paper. If you could write down the names and the phone numbers of the guys in their first 30 to 60 days that you've been trying to help, I will call them. I'll step up until you get stable to help you take your place. They won't have anybody to give you. Because they're, they had lost their way. They had lost their primary purpose. Now their primary purpose is not helping other people. Their primary purpose is them. It's their finances. It's their house. It's their business. It's their family. It's their kitchen. It's them. 
and they lost their way. And, and Wilson refers to us helping other people as our primary purpose. As a matter of fact, I think any view of the, tw of the 12 steps that doesn't include a, a commitment to step 12 is just another selfish, self-centered endeavor. You're going to get your, you're going to hone yourself into such a state of spiritual wonderfulness, you'll glow in the dark. <laughs> and we do all of this not so we glow in the dark, or not even so we feel better. We do all of this so we can become servants, so we can help God's kids. We grow in understanding and effectiveness. In the in in the seven step prayer, we're not asking God to take away the things that stand in the way of our happiness. We're asking him to take away the things that stand in the way of our usefulness. And I, I started to claim my primary purpose. And it's, it's, it's exquisite because it's real freedom. You know, I go to AA for the exact same reason I drank whiskey because whiskey set me free, free of my emotions, my thoughts, the feelings of not fitting, the depression, it just set me free when it worked, not at the end. And I do AA for the same reason. I want to be free. I think that's one of the greatest promises of the ninth step promises, this new freedom. And it really is a new freedom because I don't know that I ever, it, there were moments in early drinking where alcohol would lift me right up off of me and I could get free. And then you know what happens. If the disease progresses, it starts to turn on you, and you don't get free anymore. But I keep chasing it. And so Alcoholics Anonymous is designed to do slowly what alcohol did quickly and almost instantaneously. I run into guys. I, I, I don't know what it is. Marty can tell you. I get these guys. I become a magnet for people in AA that are sober 25, 35, 40, I got a guy 50 years sober that aren't doing well. And they come to me. You know, I, there's a lot of questions I've learned to ask them, but one of the primary questions I ask a guy who's 35 or 45 years sober and he's depressed, I'll say, well, so how many newcomers are you working with? Tell me about your home group and your commitments. What are you doing for others? And usually I hear the answer is zero. When I ask, I, I, I've had this happen to me several times. I'll ask somebody, so how many guys do you sponsor? And they'll say, I've heard that this is crazy. They'll, they'll say none, or maybe they sponsor guys, but I haven't seen them for a while. We only play golf together once a month or something, you know, something like that, right? Now, see, so and then these, some guys will say, well, I don't sponsor anybody. It's not my niche. And I think, what do you mean it's not your niche? Well, I sponsored, you know, 10 years ago, I sponsored three guys. And they all drank again. So I just make coffee. It's not my niche. It's not your niche. You've sponsored three people that drank again, and you've come to the conclusion that's not your niche. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. I have to tell them the story of Bill Wilson. I said, you know... December 15th, 1934, Bill Wilson exited Towns Hospital for the last time. And he all, there's something that happened to him in Towns Hospital. And it wasn't the light and the, it wasn't the wind from the mountaintop. After that, something happened. God came into the picture because people had been having those, those enlightened experiences throughout history. William James wrote about it. But here's where, here was the game changer. Bill Wilson was laying in his hospital bed. Now, try to picture this and tell me this had to, been, this had to be God. He's laying in the hospital bed. There's, there's, not a, there's not a friendly direction anywhere. Everywhere he looks is problems. He's ruined his life. He's going to lose his house that was his family, his wife's family's house on Clinton Street. He hasn't worked. He can't hold a job. His wife's working in, in, this, in the basement of this department store making just a nothing wage, just trying to keep them from being homeless. 
He's ruined his career in the finance industry. There's no friendly direction anywhere for him. Problems on every front. And he's laying in the hospital bed. And the thought, in the midst of all that, the thought came to him, you know, there might be hundreds or thousands of alcoholics out there I might help. Now, who comes to that conclusion in a detox? I mean, for God's sakes, I, I, I'm so inundated with problems. I'm so obsessed with me. And I think that's when God came into the picture and then, and Bill came out of Towns Hospital on, on uh, December 15th, 1934. And that's what he had. He had a conviction. He had a belief that if he, whatever that thing was that happened to him in Towns Hospital with Abby, whatever that was, that maybe he could keep it alive if he gives it away. And from, from December 15th, 34 to May 10th, 35, Bill Wilson worked with 96 failures. 96. One guy committed suicide in their house on Clinton Street that he put up. Another guy stole his suit. He had one nice suit for job interviews. Stole the suit. Another guy stole the coffee pot. Tried to, tried to trade it in for gin. Nobody stayed sober, but he persisted. He never stopped. And and there's the famous conversation before he was on his before he went to see Silkworth before his trip to Akron, where he's so in despair because nobody stayed sober. And he, he said to Lois, "I maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I should, I got to go to work. I got to get you off of that out of that department store. You've been laboring in there just to keep us alive. And maybe I was wrong." Maybe it doesn't, maybe this thing doesn't work. And, and she said to him, but Bill, you're sober. Sometimes we have to hear it from somebody else. You can't say those things to yourself. And he went and told, went to talk to Dr. Silkworth and Dr. Silkworth straightened him out because his 96 failures was a work in progress. He learned a lot from that stuff. And then Silkworth put the icing on the cake. Silkworth said, Bill, you kind of stop preaching to these people. He said, you got to tenderize them first. You can't put them on the grill until you tenderize them. And he said, you got to start telling them about the hopeless condition of mind and body. You got to tell them about the allergy. You got to tell them what you've gotten from me and use your own experience. Tell them about your hopelessness and your failure. And then maybe maybe they'll find their hopelessness too. And when they do that, then they might be ready for something else. And so he went back to Akron. His, his whole deal fell through. And I've sat, I've, I've, I've shared meetings in the Mayflower Hotel at, where they had me read the part of the, it's not fair, they had me read the part of the book where Bill's pacing in the lobby. I couldn't read it. I just started sobbing. And Bill uh, made a phone call and he met Dr. Bob Smith at the Cyberling Gate Mansion's gatehouse. And his son and I were very good friends. His son came and stayed at my house for about a week. And I remember he sat in, our, in my living room and told a whole bunch of us, probably 50 of us, the story of when he drove his dad and his mom and his sisters, him and his sister were in the front seat and Bob's in the back with, with his wife, Ann, who, and he, they're driving him to see some guy from New York about his drink and he does not want to go. He's begging him, please, please, please. Just, I, I, he felt guilty. He'd screwed up Mother's Day. And so he's guilty. And I don't know about you guys, but I've I've done some things that made me feel guilty and for, for a minute. You'll get me to do some things, anything. I mean, just because I feel guilty. And he felt guilty. And he said to he said to Anne and he said to and and his stepdaughter and uh, son, he said, Please, I don't I feel horrible. Don't don't make me stay in there more. Promise me in fifteen minutes. That's it. It's all I can take. I can't take any more than that. 
And they promised, okay, well, well, 15, just do it for 15 minutes. And he went into that cyberly gatehouse and they waited out in the other room. And they left him in there. He stayed in there for several hours. We asked Smitty, but you promised your dad that you only 15 minutes. You, and he was in there for what, four hours, something like that? What, how, what happened? He said, man, we heard our dad laugh. We hadn't heard Bob laugh in a long time. And that's the first voice of God, some of us hear. It's in the laughter. The freedom from this bondage of self. Bob connected with Bill. Not because Bill was talking to, to Bob about Bob's drinking. Bill was talking to Bob about Bill's drinking. And he did the thing that I'm sure that was the same thing I did in detox when I heard my sponsor share and I sat there and I started nodding my head. The book says, until this understanding is made, very little good can come about, really. And a connection was made, a connection that would eventually change the world. And... Uh, Bill, uh, Bill did a lot of 12-step work, uh, and so did Bob. And, and we are probably here because of the dedication and the selflessness and driven. It was all driven by desperation and hopelessness. We're here because of, of the actions of those two men. And uh, so I say to the person you... You sponsored three people, and it's not your niche, huh? I say, well, up against Bill Wilson, I think you got 93 failures to go through before you can come to that conclusion. Because 12-step work is works on a, a spiritual principle that is ancient. And that spiritual principle is if you throw enough crap up against the wall, some of it sticks. <laughs> so it's not your, your your job to be profound. It's your job to fling crap. Just start flinging crap. <laughs> Just fling. Just fling. Pick them up. If you don't have anything to say, don't take them to where there's people saying stuff. <laughs> if you don't have a message, take them to the message. Buy them a hamburger. Let them know that you understand how they feel. Because for some of us, that is some pretty seductive stuff. When people in Alcoholics Anonymous, they, they would, they, you know, one of the great things that they did is that they listened to me. Nobody had listened to me. I was a homeless guy on the streets. I mean, when you're like that, you're invisible. People listen to me, and I knew they listened to me because they would interject little things that let me know they just heard what I said, and they'd nod their head. I think it, I think listening to someone who's down and out and, and hopeless and worthless is probably one of the greatest gestures of love that you can ever, one human being could ever give another. People listen to me. And I started to, to, to grow because I, it's, it's hard, it, it's hard to not go along with you when you've been so kind to me. And uh, Wilson, uh, Wilson had a tremendous, and so did Bob. But they say Bob, uh, personally, 12 step one estimates 5,000 people. But he didn't just help them change their life. He instilled in them an ethic to go and pay this forward, go pass this on. And so they did. Um, you know, I, we do, I, I have a big book, experiential big book step workshop at my house. I've had it for almost over 34 years, maybe close to 35, I suppose. And when we get to step 12, it usually takes at least three weeks to do it because having had a spiritual awakening as the result 
of these steps, single, the only result. What does that look like? And sometimes we spend time talking about that. And then we carry this message to alcoholics, and we spend a lot of time doing that. And the book is a blow-by-blow description on how to do that. And, I, and I'll tell you, I, I did a lot of 12-step work before I ever read this book. And if you don't, if you're trying to help people and you don't have principles, all you got left is you. And I was a cowboy and I made everything. If I'd have read this book, I'd have, I would have saved some time and pain because everything in here and, and working with others says, don't do. Oh, I did it. <laughs> I did it. Everything you said, do. No, nah, I didn't want to do that. I made every mistake that it talks about and warns us against. I, I remember getting guys jobs because I know, I know if I'll get this guy a job and he'll do very well. Then he'll probably get a year and mention my name. <laughs> there was a great, uh, there was a, a federal judge. I didn't understand. I just knew him from the men's stag, a guy named Roger. I didn't know how powerful this guy was. They, actually, they named the federal building after him. That's how powerful. I didn't know that. And he just liked me. So uh, I had a sponsee, new guy, who I lied. I went to Roger. I lied to him. I said to this guy, I said to Roger, I said, I'm working with so-and-so, and he really wants to be sober. Well, that's not really true. The, what would have been true is I'm working with this guy, and I really want him to be sober. <laughs> And then I lied to him again. I said, and he's got these these warrants out, and he these warrants out for his arrest in another state. And if he could just get those off of him, he'd somehow deal, get him out of the way. He'd do well. Well, I'm the only one. See, I, I want to get him off of it. So he'll stay sober the rest of his life, and and I'll he'll just talk about me all the time. <laughs> So, true. this is a weird story, but only because Roger really liked me. He, I don't know what he did. He, he said he got, he told me to get the guy's social security number and name and everything. And I, I gave it to Roger and I don't know what he did, but he made some calls, did something. And the guy, the warrants disappeared. And the guy was drunk within a week after the disappearance of those war of those, those warrants. I thought I was helping him. I, I think maybe objectively it might have been better for me to stick a pistol to his temple because it was the warrants that brought him here. There's an old adage, if you give a man a fish, he'll eat for the day, but if you teach him how to fish, he'll eat for a lifetime. And every newcomer I've ever encountered wants fish. And all the old timers that I respect are just giving fishing lessons. They don't want it. They're not going to give you a fish. They're going to give you a fishing lesson. And I had to learn that the hard way by making the mistakes. You know, get, I, get, I would get guys jobs in AA, and then they, they'd get drunk and rob the guy in AA who gave him the job. You know, oh, jeez. And I, I think that most of us left unchecked, our ego will show up in 12-step work like an like a untreated codependent. Right, and will do more harm than good. So it, I had a guy that I, I really loved. His name was Andy, Andy Henry. And Andy and I, uh, he was one of the first guys that wasn't the first guy I ever sponsored, but he was the first guy I ever sponsored that I made that, that unbelievable connection with. You know, some of you understand this. You have this. You maybe don't have it in all your sponsors, but maybe you have it with one person where you feel very plugged in. And Andy and I had so much in common. We listened to the same bands. We both drank Richard's Wild Irish Rose, which is, that's a brotherhood right there. I mean, we both had been on methadone. We both, I mean, we had so much in common. I mean, we'd sit for hours and talk about rock and roll and bands and music. And we saw, we liked the same movies. We, we disliked this, and this is a bond that's deep. We disliked the same people in AA. You know what I mean? (laughs) 
Yeah. And Andy calls me up. Now, I'm, all, I'm not sober very long. And I don't, you, the book says you can't transmit something you haven't got that's really true. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't try to transmit something. But Andy needed more help than I could give him. And he called me up one night. He'd been to two meetings that night. And, and he, he wants to drink. I don't know what to tell him. I, I don't got nothing here. I said, well, ask God to remove the obsession to drink and go to another meeting. Go to that late night meeting. And he did, and he came out of that meeting, and the obsession was on him even worse. And he went and drank, and he came to that next morning, and he had a Kawasaki 1100 motorcycle. He went down the old L.A. Pike. He got that up to 110, 120 miles an hour and waited for an ongoing semi-truck coming the opposite direction, going 70, and he vaporized himself on the front of that truck. And I went to down to Lancaster, California, and I was... One of the pallbearers. I'll tell you, there was nothing in that casket. They they didn't get enough body parts to weigh more than about five pounds. And I remember sitting in that chapel and I'm crying because I, I, I was so conflicted because by this time, I knew one thing. I knew that I must help people in order to be free of depression just like Bill Wilson. But I also knew that I, I didn't have what he needed. I better start getting into this book. I better start arming myself and with, with more than what I got because, for God's sakes, I don't ever want to sit in another chapel where a guy that I care about is dead and realize that he, what he needed, I didn't have to give him. And I started reading, especially the chapter working with others. And I discovered that it's a sponsorship manual. I mean, there's, there's every twist and turn in there you can imagine that you'll encounter in, in a 12-step call or working with a newcomer. It's in there. It's all in there. And when I started following the principles and not my cowboy-like personality, People started staying sober. Not not everybody. Nobody nobody has that kind of track record. But guys were starting to stay sober, and they were sponsoring other people. The book says that uh, that God will show you how to create the fellowship you crave. You, I'm telling you, if you don't sponsor anybody, you don't know how disconnected you are until you get a bunch of sponsees. Truly. Truly. And so I run into these people that don't sponsor anybody, and they say, well, it's, it wasn't my niche. And I say, listen, you've got to start. Here's what I want you to do. It's very easy. If you'll follow these simple little directions, your life will change. First of all, you got to find a fishing hole. Right? Some place where there's a whole bunch of newcomers in a room. Good fishing hole. Well stocked pond. <laughs> I go to detox for the same reason that Willie Sutton said he robbed banks. He said, Well, that's because that's where the money is. <laughs> and I go to detox because they got all these newcomers just right there, right there. Go into the meeting before anybody else. Get there. Be wait for the patients to come in. S start talking to one of the guys. Just chat them up a little bit. Nothing serious, nothing heavy. Just chat them up. Tell them a little bit about your drinking. Get around to the subject of, of sponsorship. Tell them the truth. Tell them, say, you know, I found this, and I think thousands of members in AA found this, and we couldn't make it without a sponsor. Would you? Do you have a sponsor? And if he says no, just say, listen, I'm not trying to impose myself on you, but it is important to my recovery to help people. If you would be willing to be sponsored, it would be my honor, and here's my number. You do that once or twice a week for a year, I'm, I'll promise you, at the end of that year, you'll be sitting at a coffee shop somewhere with a booth full of people you sponsor, and your life will be different than it's ever been before, ever. And I, uh, I started to... I started to sponsor people following the principles. And when our, in our, in our 12th tradition, and I'll tell you, 
I'm a traditional guy, a tradition guy. I, you won't hear this often in AA, but I, I know this to be true. The, tra- the 12 traditions as originally written by Bill Wilson in the long form are the higher set of spiritual principles in Alcoholics Anonymous. They're the most effective spiritual principles for self-reduction and connectedness, more so than the steps. But they don't make any sense to you until after you work the steps. And then they fill the deficiencies. When you stop thinking about yourself and you think about a purpose, a common welfare, when your purpose stops being you, we don't make money here. The eighth tradition, Wilson says, we our 12-step work is never to be paid for. We don't promote ourselves here. We never promote ourselves. Other people can recommend you for all kinds of stuff, for delegate, for all kinds of stuff. But you, you don't, the ego is the what promotes us. They are the most effective set of spiritual principles for ego reduction, I think, more than the steps. And so I, I use those with the guys I sponsor. I want them to have a working knowledge of the long form of the 12 traditions because I love them. I, don't, I want what's best for the people I sponsor. I, I don't, this is not about getting notches in my big book. This is about doing the thing that keeps my light lit and that's helping God's kids. When I was about nine years sober, It was one of the first times I was, I didn't really speak much in AA. I was terrified of public speaking, truly. It's it's odd because I do so much of it now. But that's the truth. I really was. The first meetings I ever shared at when I was brand new was a candlelight meeting. And I discovered if I could sit in the corner, the light, I could hide in the shadow. And no, honest to God, that was it. That's where I first started sharing. And then my sponsor got me into detoxes and and jails and, and homeless shelters. And for some reason, I couldn't share in front of you, but at a homeless shelter, it was almost like my obsession with what you think of me seemed to be dialed down because you're homeless people, for God's sakes. You know, I mean, who cares? I mean, you know, well, I didn't think that, but, but it, it kind of dialed down my obsessive self-involvement somehow. And I could be honest. I could be genuine. I, I found my story in, in treatment centers and detoxes and homeless shelters like St. Vincent's. I found myself. And I, I started doing that and, and I started sponsoring guys, and I had commitments. And my, my sponsor was, you just say yes. He was a say yes to everything guy. Intergroup, GSR, DCM, area officer, convention committees, retreat committees, h and I. I mean, he just said yes. You, you positioned yourself to be a servant. And I remember one time I turned something down. And he said, I'll never forget this. He said, how do you know God didn't ask that person to ask you? How do you know? Do you know for sure? I thought, I don't know. So you just say yes. If I don't have another commitment, I I say yes. And I started to, to connect in Alcoholics Anonymous in a way that I'd never, ever, ever, ever felt connected to people and to life and to God. And I'm, I'm here. I am. I'm, I'm asked to speak up in a place called Eureka, California. It's up northern California near the coast, but the, right near, not too far from the Oregon border. And I was up there, and uh, I'd never been up there. I'd never really been much of anything or anywhere. I just host. I gave a talk. It was okay, I guess. I don't know. I, I'm so crit. My first five or six times I ever spoke in AA. For days afterwards, I'd be rehearsing what I should have said. Oh, and almost I did circling a depression doing it. I, but I, I had this host, and he was a nice guy. And the next day after the talk, I had a whole day because I came in for the whole weekend. Friday night talk, I had all day Saturday to 
And this guy said, I want to show you around. So I, he put me in his truck and he took me to this place that was called the Avenue of the Giants. Now, I had never seen anything like that. There, there were trees that were 200, 250 feet high. Some of them were 20, 25 feet in diameter. It was like walking into a scene from Jurassic Park. I mean, it was amazing. There was a presence in that forest and a quiet presence. It was really something. Well, we were there for a little while. And the guy says to me, come on, I'm going to get in the truck. I want to take you down to the coast because there's these rock monoliths that, that come up 100 feet or more right out of the ocean. He said, it's amazing. It's cliffs. You've got to see all this. So I, okay. So I get in this truck and we're driving along. And it's a ways. We're passing these meadows and fields. And he says to me, he said, do you notice how you don't see a 200-foot tree by itself in the middle of the field? I said, yeah. He said, you know why that is? I, I said, no, I don't. He said, well, God's created these trees in such a manner that they cannot help but aspire to grow to these magnificent heights. The problem is if they grow up alone, they will literally outgrow their roots capacity to support them and they will topple over and die on their own aspired magnificence. They must grow up in community and they interlock the roots into a net below the floor of the forest and this supports them and allows them to grow into God's vision of the tree. And I thought, oh my God, isn't that what happened to me? I came to you and I, I'm lost. I'm afloat in the universe. I'm, I'm suicidal. I'm depressed. I'm a mess. Totally dying of what felt like loneliness. And I get this sponsor who's fanatical and he will not negotiate anything. <laughs> and he wants me to do service and he wants me to sponsor people and he wants me to have commitments. And little did I know that I was literally intertwining the roots of my life with yours. And that has allowed me to grow into my nature. I have a really good life today. And I got to tell you, this is the honest to God truth. It's not my fault. <laughs> Truly. I just came here sick enough and desperate enough and hopeless enough to, to get a sponsor and follow his directions. I've had a problem all my life. A problem that caused depression it caused anxiety. It caused a restlessness inside of me. And I got this thing inside of me that just wants. It wants. If he asked me, what do you want? I don't know. <laughs> Yours? Different? More? I don't know. And half the time when I get what I want, that, that ain't it. That ain't it. Nah. <laughs> And I never could find the off switch to the wanter. And consequently, I'd be depressed and disillusioned and let down a lot in my life. And it plagued me. This chronic dissatisfaction. I have a spot. He says, he says, I don't know, but I think I was born disappointed. <laughs> and so what happens is we come to Alcoholics Anonymous and I get a sponsor and I work these steps. And I start to want what God wants. I start to seek his will through my actions. I loved, I loved what Kent said about uh, the trick. Your feet were trained against your head, your, against your mind. And through the actions of Alcoholics Anonymous, I, I've changed the result I've gotten out of life. There was a, an early sobriety there was a guy I used to go to meetings with, and he was a pilot. And he said a couple things that really, I've never forgot this. He said that he thought AA could stand for altered attitudes, which I didn't like because people all my life were telling me, you got a bad attitude. And then he explained what an attitude was. It was the it used in, in avionics. It's the angle of approach. You get a good attitude, you land right on that runway, even in the, even in the night, in the dark because it's your angle of approach. And then he told a story, and, and I'll tell you this story, and then I'm going to end. 
He said one time he was flying this little plane and he he went up higher than his normal ceiling in this plane. He was up and he hit a thing that I don't know if I understand it. I'm not a pilot, but he, he called it a wind shear. And it's, I guess, it's two opposing currents of air that will throw a little plane like that into a tailspin. And he said, it's it's the most frightening thing you've ever experienced. You, Every emotion inside of you is screaming that you're going to crash and die. And every instinct in you is to pull back on that stuff, to bring that up, that nose up. And he said, we learn that if you do that, you will surely crash and die. What you must do is counterintuitive. It's against everything you feel. You must push that thing forward as if you want to make it into a nosedive and then let it go. And it snaps back. And he said, that plane was made by its creator to right itself. And I'll tell you what I've come to believe. I think my life is exactly like that. You look back over over 43 and a half years and you find every time I was in trouble or a disaster, you could send a CSI team in there and I'm the guy that pushed the thing, I pulled it back. I'm the guy. My, it's my DNA and fingerprints all over that wreck. But maybe, maybe that there never was a problem in my life, ever, maybe never. Maybe it's just the ramblings of an ego that has to scare me in order to control me. Because my ego will worry me into the driver's seat. It'll worry. I, I'm, I'm capable of lying to you. You scare me enough, I'll lie to you. I may have to make amends later, but I'm capable. I'm capable of horrible selfish acts if I'm afraid enough. And what if the things I've been afraid of all my life, what if they never had any reality? What if the truth is we've never left the Garden of Eden? Everything is in divine order. We just don't see it because I listen to the crap factory between my ears that scares me. Dr. Paul, who was a good friend of mine, said, he said, I'm amazed how when I'm out helping God's kids, my problems just seem to die of neglect. <laughs> because maybe they never existed to begin with. This has been a great weekend. I want to thank, I've, I've got to watch, I'll tell you, I, I love, I've watched my wife. We, she came to Vegas two years ago. She rolled up her sleeves. She sponsors probably 15 women. And She's, I get, I like to watch her. Truth be told, she's probably a better AA member than I am. Because I go to the big meetings. My home group has a lot of huge meetings and I sponsor, you know, I might sponsor 40, 50 guys in one of those meetings. And I get caught up with them and my, because we're close. I know I've sponsored some of these guys for decades. And I get talking to them, but not Marnie. Marnie's got the radar looking for that new girl. Looking for that girl she's never seen before. And like she's an arrow shot out of a bow, she's on those new girls. They can't, they, they don't have a chance. They don't have a chance. And not as she just on them. She brings all their little pigeons with her. And they all just surround the new girl. And next thing they know, they got her. What, this girl's picking her up Monday night. This girl's picking her up Tuesday night and this Wednesday night. And God, I get to watch... God show how Marnie how to create the fellowship she craves. And the more, and I, <laughs> this, is, this is kind of sounds like a terrible thing to say, but it's true. The more people she sponsors, the more she likes me. <laughs> I don't understand the dynamic, but I'll take it. I'll take it. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.